All right, welcome everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us for part two of our two part series on reducing reliance on pesticides. First, you'll be hearing from Chris Geiger, who manages San Francisco's green purchasing and IPM programs. Chris will share San Francisco's approach to IPM. Um, and San Francisco has been recognized as a leader in urban integrated pest management for decades. Second, you'll hear from Jack Lucier, who's the district's ground manager for Portland Community College. And Jack oversees Portland Community College's effective campus integrated pest management program. And in addition to the two presenters who are here today, we have Sharon Salvaggio with us, and she's the Xerces Pesticide Program Specialist. And she'll be here to help answer questions at the end. Thank you, Molly, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been working with this program for the past 18 years, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how the program came to be, where it came from, uh, what it is, and uh, especially how it relates to pollinator conservation efforts and maybe come away with a few lessons for uh, people in the audience. I know it's a pretty diverse audience, but some of you may be in a position where you are trying to get such a program started in your um, uh, local, local um, jurisdictions. And so there might be some lessons here also. So um, let's see if the technology will smile upon me here. Okay. So it all began for us back in 1995 when there was a, uh, a campaign to get pesticide use out of parks. Uh, and uh, the, as this being San Francisco, this campaign developed very quickly into an ordinance that was actually surprisingly sweeping, even to the activists who were pushing for it and uh, placed a ban on all pesticide use for city properties. All pesticides, all properties. Uh, just for reference, uh, most cities in the US do not have uh, the ability to regulate uh, private properties for pesticide, pesticide use. They're preempted by the feds and, and the state. So it was a sweeping ban that did not last long. Um, because there were things like disinfectants in hospitals, there were public health treatments, there were uh, various public safety situations that at least they thought required pesticide use to address. And so uh, the ordinance was, was changed and it looks more like this now. Uh, the, the basic mandates are uh, we follow an IPM approach. So integrated pest management um, is a horrible term, but we're stuck with it. It really means using uh, the science as a basis, the biology and ecology of pests as a basis for making uh, informed decisions about pest management approaches using all available uh, approaches and saving the more disruptive approaches for last, and that usually means pesticides. So pesticides as a last resort. So an IPM approach in all operations in the city, restrictions on pesticides. So that has taken the form of a list of, of approved products. We call it the reduced risk pesticide list. Excuse me. There, is, there are provisions for exemptions for special cases, posting, record keeping requirements. All contractors have to comply with it requires IPM plans and annual public hearing for better communication. So that's, that's the, the basic ordinance. But when it first came on board, uh, there was a pretty drastic drop in pesticide use. And there are some very good reasons for that. Uh, one story that I like to tell is about Golden Gate Park. And this may be addressed at the older generation in the audience, but it's pretty easy to imagine daisies in Golden Gate Park. Uh, after all, when you come to San Francisco, you wear flowers in your hair, right? Okay, so uh, before this ordinance, uh, the city was regularly treating for daisies in these big meadows and a variety of reasons. Maybe they wanted a cl cleaner aesthetic or they were afraid of liability from bee stings on people's bare feet as they went dancing through the park. Um, Soon after the ordinance was put in place, this was stopped and that saved tons and tons of herbicide use. It reduced it 
dramatically. It also, I'm sure, had a big benefit for pollinators. So these sorts of simple things were, were the first up, uh, the first um, targets uh, when the ordinance first came on board. Um, we have our own screening system for pesticides that we use. Everything we use has gone through the screening system. It's a very simplified review of hazards. And I won't go into the details except to say that the tier one is the most hazardous uh, level, tier three is least. Uh, tier one is basically carcinogens, reproductive toxins, uh, danger labeled products, so forth. Tier three is uh, food grade uh, oils, for example, uh, soaps, microbials. So, and then tier two is everything in between. So we've used that as a way to get a laser focus on what we want to work on, which, which products we want to replace with safer alternatives. Uh, it's part of the picture, but definitely not the whole picture. So we have an annual um, process. If you're going to have a list like this, you need to have a group of committed people and some expertise uh, available to manage it. It can't just be a, a list that you pull out of the blue. Uh, we really believe very strongly in honoring the expertise of the people who are doing the work on the ground and bringing them in. So every year we have kind of a continual improvement process with the list where we have suggested additions and deletions from our staff. We do a hazard screening of pesticides that are candidates for the list. Uh, we have a review by our technical advisory committee or TAC. Uh, it's a couple of days work, a day or two of work meetings where we go through list product by product and ask, is it working? Uh, is there uh, a safer product available? Is, what's the exposure potential? Um, what are the alternatives and what are the likely risks from the alternatives to that product, whether they're chemical or something else? And really, do we need to treat for this problem at all is a really fundamental question that we always have to ask. Um, and then finally, every year it goes to our commission, a public hearing and our commission for approval. So that's, it's a managed list. It's actually the the process for hazard review is, is, is now part of the lead, uh, U.S. Green Building Council lead checklist references um, for one of its credits. And, um, and then the, this, the process that we have for the pesticide list, I think is used, something similar is used by a number of other cities around the country. The good news is um, when you look at the tier one, the highest hazard pesticides, um, the numbers are good. Since 2010, which is our baseline year now, um, it's been a 97% reduction um, in the use of those pesticides. But this really doesn't paint the whole picture. And that's part one of the lessons here that I wanted to share. Uh, first of all, the 97% reduction is, is, understate, is understating the impact because we've also managed to kick out of the list a lot of the more hazardous, the, like the really nasty products, over the years, we have kicked them out. So uh, tier one is a very big categorization, but there's uh, there were some much worse tier one products that are no longer in use. Those are gone. Um, another thing is that um, if you look at, for example, pesticide use in our parks, um, here's, here's a graph showing, uh, kind of three kinds of usage, usage in our parks in the city. The light blue is golf, uh, the dark is parks and facilities, and the dotted is uh, natural areas, which is basically habitat management. And you can see that golf kind of washes everything out. We have um, a tournament course that is under contract to be uh, play ready, tournament ready at all times. And it's a, it's a delicate negotiation with um, with the tournament uh, to uh, be able to reduce the risk in that golf course environment and still um, have it tournament ready because the cosmetic requirements are so high. So this is what it looks like, the trend for has highest hazard pesticides, which looks great. Uh, everyone would say, yeah, this is where we wanna go. If you look at the other stuff, the lower hazard, 
you'll see something like this. And that looks a little scary. Um, and for the casual onlooker, and that's most people in the city, uh, this might be cause for concern. But what is hidden here is the fact that, that the pesticides that are the lower hazard pesticides, the ones that are high volume here, first of all, are mostly used on golf courses. This is Harding Park. Um, and when they use it at all, it's a very large use. But also these are products, the, the biggest products here are mineral oil for fung uh, fungus prevention and a neem oil, which is a botanical oil that's used for a variety of pests, uh, especially on greens. So it ends up being very high volume and it just washes out the data. Um, just as an example, here's at the golf course. This is a, uh, <clears throat> I think it's called saliva, <coughs> excuse me, and weed that you can barely see under the grass, which is almost impossible to even pick out with your fingers. But that is considered a pest in the world of tournament golf. And uh, we've had sessions where we had volunteers picking this stuff, not at the golf course, but at uh, other fields, um, uh, picking it out by hand for many, many hours. Very challenging to not use herbicides for some of these things and still comply with the contract requirements for the golf course. Another thing to be aware of when you're looking at pesticide use as a, as a metric is the, the safer products that we are, that are tier two and tier three products, many of them are what we call burn down herbicides. And that basically kills the, the weed above the ground, knocks back the foliage, but it doesn't necessarily kill the roots on the first try. And, excuse me, if you compare a typical highest hazard product like Garlon on the left with Avenger on the right, you'll have to use 26 times more active ingredient for the Avenger, the safer product, with each application. And then you will have to have more than one application for that product to have the same effect. So that makes it look like pesticide use is going through the roof. Um, um, so uh, this is just a warning about relying on <clears throat> pesticide statistics as your, as your measure of success. Um, another thing that is worth noting, and one thing I'm really happy about, is over the years, we are barely using any insecticides. We had seven pounds of insecticide active ingredient used citywide if you don't count that golf course. And almost all of that was for cockroach baits, for example, um, um, borates and gel baits and things like that for structural pest control. It wasn't anything that would affect pollinators. Now, in the golf course, as I mentioned, it was neem oil and there, was hun there were hundreds of pounds of that used because it's a big area. So, um, one has to be a little careful when you're making interpretations on, on uh, some of these statistics. So one, one conclusion here, and see if you can figure out what the message is. <laughs> we, I mean, we always repeat this. Just having a list is not a, a program at all. You can't just take someone else's list, say, we're going to use this and have a program and have some success. Um, First of all, because the lists are really tailored to the location. Uh, I'm sure Portland has much different conditions um, in its rose garden than we do down here, for example. And they need to have a tailored um, set of products and practices. The other thing is that, and this is where I start sounding counter-revolutionary, but our program is not a pesticide reduction program. It's a harm reduction program. We are trying to uh, reduce the harm caused by pesticides and by pests. And there are significant harms caused, especially in structural situations, public health hazards from the pests themselves. And I have lots of really gross photos, which I've spared you today, <laughs> of cockroaches and rats in affordable housing that really suffered from no good pest management is what they suffered from. So uh, it's very important to us, it has been to, to keep, keep that in mind. This is all about, um, about minimizing harm and uh, 
whatever that may be. So the, the list is not the core of the program. The real core of the program is the people. And in this case, our IPM Technical Advisory Committee. Um, the Technical Advisory Committee um, is a group of IPM coordinators from various city departments. And I, I, if I have a success metric for all of this, it is that our, this committee has been meeting almost monthly, this interdepartment voluntary committee has been meeting monthly for over 20 years. And actually enrollment has grown. We have a lot of other people coming to these open meetings. We have speakers and we have continuing education and so forth that helps. But that is the core. This is a group, it's a peer learning network. You could use lots of fancy names for it. It's a club, it's a cult, it's a, it's, it has its own corporate culture, and they're all committed to this goal of figuring out how to manage landscapes in an ecologically sound way, how to, how to use the least harmful approaches in structures. And it, when you go to these meetings, there's a whole lot of discussion and advice going between people, not just one way from the speaker to the crowd. So if if a, um, my one piece of advice for any jurisdiction that's going to start a program is to is to put a lot of energy into organizing a a committee of uh, you know community of of interest on this, and to do lots and lots and lots of trainings. In addition, we have springtime trainings with hundreds of uh, rec park gardeners and uh, public utilities gardeners every year. Uh, we we have like interactive pest ID sections uh, sessions like these. Um, we have uh, specialized trainings from time to time. We had a goat summit, a rodent summit, a turf summit. Um, we've had lots of these sorts of sideline trainings, and that all not only adds to the expertise, uh, but also to the sense of community in that that group of people, that IPM tech that is the centerpiece of the program. So that's where it's at, is in that the group of people. Um, I, there, one other requirement of, the, um, of our ordinance is IPM plans. And um, you may hear some more discussion about IPM plans. It's required for our city departments to have IPM plans. Um, I would say what we learned is scale is extremely important. Uh, back in the beginning in the 90s, they submitted it because they had to, and most of them were utter trash. Uh, most of them were, were just exercises so they could have something on file. What was really important was having IPM plans for particular situations or for particular facilities. So the scale of the plan was super important. An example is the golf course. We, one of the reasons, I think the biggest reason we were able to reduce use there is we had we had a consultant help us put together a plan for um, uh, managing that in, in the most ecologically sustainable way. So, uh, um, of course, you know, in addition to pesticides, you know, we rely on most of the time, pesticides are a very, very small part of the program. There's a whole lot of other stuff a lot of volunteer weeding efforts, tens of thousands of hours go into volunteer weeding in the parks. Um, and actually people, people enjoy it. It's something to do together, it's physical. Uh, you feel like you're making a difference. You can see the difference you're making. Those are weed wrenches, by the way, they're used for, um, for uh, French broom. Uh, goats are used on lots of rights of ways. Everyone loves goats. Um, We've got lots of other pilot tests going on at any given time. Right now, uh, we are trying out a rat contraceptive family planning for rats, very important. <laughs> and um, there seems to be some positive uh, results from that. And it's extremely expensive. We're not sure how, how much we're going to really be able to apply this in the end, still figuring that out. But rat baits are a serious um, wildlife hazard and we've made an effort over the years to minimize them, although not, we haven't been able to completely eliminate them. Um, we've, of course, tried lots of alternative herbicides, especially alternatives to Roundup, which, as many of you know, has been in the spotlight the past few years. Um, 
and we found, you know, there are no drop-in replacement for that particular product. Um, one of the sad realities of that whole situation has been a, a lot of jurisdictions just automatically banned it um, to meet sort of a political need. And it, what happened in the background was they were using much worse products to do the job, but products that weren't named Roundup. And so, uh, that was, um, we kind of had to stand our ground on this one and say, look, we want, we want to make sure what we're using is actually the safest product. So we um, put severe restrictions on Roundup and, you know, did a lot of pilot tests with other stuff. And we've had a 98.4% reduction in Roundup use, but it's still on our list for very, very specific situations. Um, also, unfortunately, and this is made national news, I think, some of the um, products that have sprung up to replace Roundup or you know, sprung up as so-called organic um, herbicides were being peddled by people who were not honest. And one of them is called Weed Slayer, another one is Ecomite Pro. Uh, the companies were caught by our, our state uh, Department of Food and Agriculture caught putting standard herbicide ingredients in these products that were being sold as organically certified. So Weed Slayer, a lot of organic growers were using it. We started using it, it seemed to work pretty well. And then we found this out. And now there is a very tiny fine being levied against the company, relatively speaking, in my opinion, uh, but much more significant, significant is there are lots of organic growers who are leading a class action lawsuit against this company because they are losing money big time if they lose their certification. So that's a little bit of an aside, but it's um, uh, I, I want to just say that uh, it, it, it takes some attention to find safer alternatives. And sometimes even if you do your best and, and something like this happens. Um, another another uh, thing we've had to deal with is just being honest about the trade-offs of all the non-chemical approaches, uh, like, like um, gas-powered weed whips, widely used. And there is pretty good data now from our um, Air Resources Board on uh, cancer risk from inhaling those fumes all day. There's a worker health hazard for sure from using these two cycle motors on, on a regular basis especially chainsaws, actually, that was the highest risk. Um, <clears throat> and so you can't automatically assume that because it's not a pesticide that it's safer. And so along that lines, we started doing pilot testing, increased pilot testing of rechargeable landscaping equipment. This is um, quickly becoming the norm. Uh, th there's a lot of new equipment that's very good uh, and that can be drop-in replacement for uh, gas-powered. Uh, equipment. Um, <clears throat> almost every year at our public hearing, the biggest question we have to answer is why do we have to remove vegetation at all? Why are we spraying in habitat uh, management areas? Uh, why is there any spray at all that's needed? This is toxic, this is hazardous, and so forth. And I, th there is a very, this is a very good question. Um, and the question really is where do you draw the line? on habitat protection versus risk reduction for people who are using the area. Um, we have some very good reasons in the Bay Area to, to do habitat management, which sometimes requires herbicides where there's no other tool that can specifically kill um, offending plants without affecting the surrounding plants, for example. Um, we're in a um, biosphere reserve, uh, we have endangered species on uh, city properties uh, that we are required to protect, uh, including the Mission Blue Butterfly now. Um, we have restoration sites where we're restoring native um, plants that um, uh, often require the same treatment in order to um, get them off the ground. And having the native species is a big plus for pollinators as well. We have to remind ourselves of that. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of other reasons. Sometimes, you know, they're valid. Sometimes there are non-pesticide alternatives, but protecting pi pipelines, and we have hundreds of miles of pipeline rights of way with fire 
fire uh, regulations that affect vegetation management along those pipelines. Earthen dams also regulated by the state, can't have any woody vegetation, any trees on that dam. Fires, of course, protecting roads and, and infrastructure. And then things like um, having to remove trees uh, uh, and prevent them from re-sprouting and being a, a fire hazard. So there are a lot of reasons why we are not able to, to, to make zero pesticide use our goal. I think it's unrealistic for a city of any size to do that. <clears throat> I think the big picture is more important. And so when we sat back and thought about this a few years into the program, um, and we were thinking about what, what is integrated pest management, and we like to think of it as a pyramid, and you probably see this pyramid again today. <laughs> um, the, um, you can think of it as the, the big stuff that you want to work on is at the base of the pyramid. And in our version of this pyramid, um, that's design and maintenance issues and physical mechanical approaches where uh, the pesticides are the last resort at the very top. And even there, we do screening of which pesticides we use. <clears throat> so we, de we decided like 10 years ago, that we were not doing enough on the prevention side of things and that there were actually no resources out there on how to prevent pests in buildings specifically. So we um, uh, actually were lucky to receive a CDC grant and <clears throat> organize a national committee on this topic and put together a peer reviewed set of guidelines on how to design pests out of structures and <clears throat> These are not, um, this, I always say, it's not rocket science. This is plugging up the goals, destroying habitat, getting rid of moisture and food sources, habitat and um, hidden voids in cabinets, things like that. But it adds up. And that turned into, uh, we were very lucky to be able to put those into practice in our affordable housing renovations. Um, 34, let's see, 3,495 units of affordable housing. We built some kind of pest prevention into them. And believe me, they needed it. It was really horrible conditions in many of those units. It was unbelievable that people were living there. <clears throat> and we're now following up on that effort. Well, we, we also were asking ourselves, well, what about landscapes? You know, humans are really occupying a lot of landscape these days um, that were formerly was formerly occupied by other organisms and here's is a city in brazil and 20 years later and just to remind ourselves that we are expanding dramatically covering the land so why can't we do something like that pest prevention guidelines for landscapes so a couple of years ago we did take that project on as well in a more local basis. This was a smaller scale project. Things like, uh, I mean, simple things like putting a mowing strip under fences so you don't have to control the weeds that are against the fence, <coughs> whether it's weed whips or spraying. Lots of, lots of little tactics we assembled into a um, <clears throat> resources. And this, these are both available on our website, uh, pest prevention by design for landscapes and pest prevention by design for structures. Uh, the one for landscapes is in a database form. You can look things up and it's also a, a living document that we're continuing to try to grow. Um, a very big part of, um, of, of, plant, of pre uh, preventing pest problems in landscapes, and that includes weeds and includes insects, rodents, everything. A big part of that is planting the right plant in the right place. And so, um, that program had a big overlap with our, our efforts at biodiversity conservation. As I mentioned, we have uh, endangered and, and rare species on city properties that we're putting a lot of effort into preserving. <clears throat> uh, we have uh, 150 species of, of just bees in the city. And uh, we've done you know, some surveys on what's out there. There's 22 species of California rare plants 10 federally endangered species and a lot of areas. We have quite a big park system uh, in addition to Golden Gate Park. We have Presidio Trust at the, the top there, which is not city, it's national, federal, uh, and a lot of smaller parks to where this happens. 
So out of that sort of a combination of the biodiversity program and the IPM program, we started putting together a semblance of a pollinators a pollinator program as well. And this is everyone's favorite, the ultra green sweat bee. Um, <clears throat> and the, the elements of that pollinators program were three calls to action. One is for residents uh, to avoid uh, some of the harmful pesticides that are typically sold in the hardware stores. And we have a, 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 an organization called Our Water, Our World that publishes a lot of wonderful, um, uh, clearly written uh, resources on this. Um, there is also uh, a guide here in SF called SF Plant Finder that lets you search, <coughs> excuse me, a number of uh, uh, filter categories and find plants really for your neighborhood. And then also the third thing is uh, there is a certification program for sustainable landscapes. Um, here in California, it's called Rescape, it used to be called Bay Friendly Landscaping. I think they use both names. Here's a glimpse at the SF Plant Finder. You can search for pollinator plants, you can search for low water, you can search for um, your neighborhood, uh, lots of things, super handy tool. <clears throat> and then here's um, uh, in Rescape California, uh, which uh, is now, it's its own nonprofit. They are certifying landscapes. They, there's a couple in San Francisco. There's a lot more in the East Bay. And uh, a big, the concept behind Rescape is looking at everything at once, um, nurturing the soil, creating wildlife habitat, conserving water, sending less to the landfill, conserving energy, conserving water, um, and using local resources. So, um, and, and I should say reducing pesticides is part of that as well. So that, that is a, like a, sweeping view of what we've been doing in San Francisco. And if there's, there's a few lessons here uh, that I just sort of threw together, but for our program, I, th I think from what we've learned here, um, having an overarching policy or ordinance is very important. Um, you have to get everyone have that initial kick to get things going. <clears throat> and then like the number one priority here is building a community of practice, building that group of people who are devoted to this, who uh, in our case, the coordinators from their various departments, but we have that community has, has grown to include other agencies in the Bay Area that regularly attend our meetings. Um, you're welcome, anyone on here is welcome to attend our IPM TAC meetings. Um, I'll, I'll provide some uh, links um, afterwards uh, other lessons, having real emphasis on training, using a pesticide list, I think is really helpful and probably essential for defining the outer boundaries of what the program should be using in the way of tools um, and tracking that pesticide use, but knowing the limitations of that metric. So as I said, it's not about getting to zero because uh, you'll never really get there, but it's, it's really helpful to be able to track where you are. Developing IPM plans um, at an appropriate scale. So uh, facility wide, facility is a good scale. Um, or in this case, there was a golf course, right? But maybe not for a whole city department or a whole city that gets diluted and generalized and is not very helpful in my opinion. Um, that focus on prevention, of course, and we're seeing more of that now uh, with, from designers include, as well as from pest, ma pest managers. And then sticking to the science. Um, we have a lot of public opinion, a lot of very strong opinion, public opinion. We respect that. We, we have an obligation to engage with the community. And we also have an obligation to stay intellectually honest about what the science says. On, in terms of risks and so forth. So um, that's always a challenge. So that's what I've got for you today and happy to answer questions.
you may have. Thank you, Chris. That was a great overview of what San Francisco is doing. A lot to think about from that. Um, so if people have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we're gonna go on to our second presenter and then we'll answer questions from both presentations at the end. Um, but feel free to enter those now. So our next speaker is Jack Lucier. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start out this uh, presentation with a, a small video of our B campus program here. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and start this. horticulturist and a groundskeeper here at Rock Creek and I have been into uh, plants and growing things since a very small child and that's what got me into beekeeping. Well bees are important not only because they give us fabulous honey but because they carry on all the pollination and so if you don't have bees, then you can't have your vegetables or your fruits. I am bringing honeybees out here on Saturday. Yeah, I actually offered it because when I was here, I saw the garden and realized too, when all the blooming was going on with all the trees that were in bloom, we had millions of blooms and there just weren't any bees out here. And I thought it would be a great place to have bees and so I just offered to put some beehives out here and uh, they were able to get the okay to go ahead and try it this year. What honeybees like and need we think and there's still a lot of unknowns we think that honeybees benefit from having a diverse diet. I'm Glenn Andreessen I teach a beginning backyard beekeeping class quarterly at PCC. A strong hive looks like there's just more bees than, than should belong in there. And it's a condition that we really like to see because the more bees you have, the more honey you're going to get. The flip side is the more bees that you have, the greater the likelihood is that they will swarm. <clears throat> so anyone can raise bees. It's not very hard to do, at least the way that I do it. I just harvest once a year at the end, right before, you know, when fall hits. Um, so I let the bees do their thing all year, all summer long, and then I harvest in the fall. So I use the Langstroth hive. It's the, I think it's the easiest way to keep bees because the parts are interchangeable. The, the bees don't glue it to the sides and, and it's been virtually unchanged for 150 years. Well, I found a bee breeder that is here in the Portland area, and they are using a new variety or a newer variety of bee that seems to be very hardy and adapting well and not having the problems with the collapse. 
So they have tried out some new um, different species of bees that are a little bit hardier. The bee population in the United States has been affected by what we just as a catch-all call colony collapse disorder. And the losses have been relatively consistent since it was first really noticed in the I can't remember exactly, 2004, 2005 or so. So they'll be healthy in the fall when they're kind of put away for the winter. And then in the spring, the whole hive can be dead. And um, they're calling that, you know, colony collapse. But they haven't really figured out exactly what's causing it or how to keep it from happening. The experts aren't any closer really on figuring out what is causing it. It's no doubt a combination of things. I think that the still biggest cause is the parasitic mite called Varroa, the Varroa destructor mite. And so there are some natural things. They naturally will die and there will be some natural colony collapse, but we've just seen it in such great numbers. And that's the issue here is that when you have half of your bees die, then that's a problem. There just won't be enough bees to pollinate. And can you imagine if we had to pay people to go out and try to pollinate these plants? So bees do an incredible service to us and they do it all for free and they do it so well that um, we just really can't replace bees. So we need to give them a helping hand by um, you know, producing them, putting out hives, moving hives around to places where we need them to do pollination and just doing what we can to help them out. <clears throat> okay, so let's get into this presentation. Um, I've got uh, I've got about 150 slides, probably take about two or three hours. So I hope everybody's uh, sitting. I'm kidding. I have about 35 slides and uh, I'll go through the IPM uh, program here at Portland Community College. It should take about 20 minutes. I've got some uh, pictures at the end um, for everybody to review. Um, so what is IPM? It's the process of achieving long-term environmentally sound pest suppression through a wide variety of tactics. Control strategies in an IPM plan include structural and procedural improvements to reduce that food, water, and shelter that the pests use to access. It's the, it's look at it as a three-legged stool. And if you could take one of those out, the food, the water, the shelter, then you're ahead of, in the game. <clears throat> um, a little bit about the Oregon uh, statute. So in 2009, they mandated uh, IPM in schools law that began in 2012. And we created our IPM program and poof, there's Jack as the uh, IPM coordinator. I got a, I got a more tasks on my job. So it's been a, it's been challenging. It's uh, really reduced our pesticide use at the college here. Uh, some of, we, we talked about this earlier, Chris talked about this earlier about the IPM uh, triangle and the foundation is the start for your uh, education and communication. <clears throat> and then we move up to cultural sanitation practices and physical and mechanical control. And last is the, the, uh, the use of pesticides. And pesticides are a tool in your toolbox. I, uh, I, I pull that tool out every once in a while. We, we try not to use pesticides as, as much as uh, we can. Um, <clears throat> So education, um, it's the foundation, like I just said before. Uh, it's part of the IPM program. It's the, it's the basis. Um, it's essential to know what the conditions are that cause these pest problems and why and how to monitor for pests and proper ID and the pest behavior before we can actually manage the pests. And so what, uh, what we do here at the colleges is when uh, somebody is onboarded, a new hire, they go through a whole bunch of safety training. And part of that is uh, an hour of IPM training and pest reporting and how to go about doing that. And then of course, for the communication part, we send out our, you know, our summer break letters, explaining to everybody that, hey, make sure you put away your food stuff, take your stuff home. 
and uh, it's uh, it's helped. It really has. Um, cultural sanitation practices. Um, knowing human behavior encourages pests help to prevent them becoming a problem. Small changes in cultural and sanitation practices can help significantly in reducing the pest population. Um, you know, it comes down to, you know, dump your trash daily. It, it's that simple, you know, not leaving your food items out and cleaning up after yourselves. And it's a tough one here at the college because we have so many people here, so many people. Um, physical and mechanical controls. Um, so rodent traps, sticky monitoring traps for insects, you know, make sure you get your door sweeps in, you're sealing your holes under your sinks and your outside access, proper drainage, mulching of the landscapes, and you're gonna keep that vegetation off the buildings 24 inches. Uh, we actually have that in our spec specifications for new buildings designed to build. Um, and we'll go into this a little bit more with some photos later in the presentation here. Um, so pesticides, IPM focuses on remediation of the fundamental reasons why pests are here and that pesticides should be used only when necessary. It's, it's a last resort for us. We just don't pull out uh, our pesticides out of the toolbox unless we really, really have to. Um, uh, you know, you could use like an ant infestation. We have ant, ants up here and uh, it can go all the way to, hey, we just need to do a deep clean and, and wipe up and clean up after ourselves all the way to, yeah, we've got, uh, you know, 100 or, two ant, 100 or 200 ants here. We need to put a little taro down. So we use, we use taro out here. And then uh, the last resort would be like a foundation spray with a, a, a termidor. Um, and we've used, we've done that before in the past, uh, probably maybe two or three times in 20 years. So uh, reduce of pesticide use is, is number one on our, our books. Um, so inspections, uh, as the IPM coordinator, I routinely inspect the campuses. Uh, these inspections focus on the kitchens and the staff and uh, childcare facilities and, and any other areas that we have concerns on. And then we, we have reports and uh, we use uh, Oregon State University has a great IPM program template. If you want to look at their website, um, that's what we used. Uh, we modified it to the college's needs. And uh, they have some great reporting uh, records on their website. So I, I suggest you go there and, and take a look at that. Um, <clears throat> so monitoring, it's, it's the most important part of the IPM plan. It uh, provides you, you know, accurate information to make sure that you're doing effective pest management decisions. Um, we gather all this information from monitoring with the sticky traps, and it tells us, you know, what kind of pests we have, where they're coming from, you know, what stage of life cycle they're in. So monitoring is, is a big part of our program. Um, the college uses a low impact list that the, uh, we go through the state and we only use caution label only, no warning or danger, and no carcinogenic uh, pesticides are used, unless it's a health hazard. Um, there's some times where we, we will use rodenticide. We've done that maybe two times in 10 years where we've had an infestation. And so we've had to put out some rodenticide. And so all our applications are done by licensed apprentice or technicians that have a, a state license. And so uh, we need to put out 24 hours before we do any applications, we have to notify and post. And we use our Gmail calendar and emails or just a broad Gmail uh, send to staff and students. And that postings that we put out on the property are 24 hours before the application and those are left up for 72 hours afterwards. And that's part of the IPM law here in the state. That's a must do. So one of the things that we're proud of here at uh, PCC is that we were able to go herbicide free throughout the district in 2015 for about five or six years. Unfortunately, they, uh, they sent us home when the pandemic hit and they said, come back and mow the lawns every other Monday, which did not work for us very well. 
And so uh, they realized that it looked like an apocalypse had basically hit here. And so we did go back and we have been using herbicides due to workload and uh, heavy weed infestations. Um, we do use uh, casuals for a lot of hand weeding and weed burning and string trimming. Unfortunately, due to budget cuts, we, we haven't been able to bring our casuals back. And so we have gone back to some herbicide use. Uh, some of the challenge we've had is uh, community members see the postings and the emails and they ask more about what we're doing and what kind of pesticides we're using. Uh, there's more paperwork and planning to go along with the program, as you can see. Um, some of the recommendations I would recommend is to get an IPN plan in place, even if it's from another school, at least you get your template going and you can modify it to, to, to the needs of your facilities. Um, Oregon State has a great one. Um, you, you, you should hire an IPM coordinator or assign somebody to be an IPM coordinator. It's great to have licensed applicators and apprentices. Um, and then review and update your plan uh, about every, every two or three years. Um, some of the things that we're doing is we're testing our soils. Um, we're, uh, we, uh, they have a holiday plan for fertilizing our lawns. Uh, as you can guess, it's all dated through the four, the four applications are for uh, on the holiday dates, you know, like July 4th, that kind of stuff. Uh, we, won't, we, we look at our soil tests and decide whether or not we need to fertilize. Uh, you know, we do a lot of liming, aeration, and overseeding. And uh, we mow all our turf at three inches to uh, choke out that, uh, the weeds. And then uh, we water to ET, evapotranspiration. So we only put back what, what the soil needs, the plant needs for water. So we don't, we're not overwatering. And so we're gonna get into some photos here. This is food stuff just being left out. Um, this really attracts the, the ants and the mice. Uh, you know, people say, oh, it's only been out for three or four hours. Um, yeah, can you put it in a plastic container? You know, keep it sealed up. During the pandemic, we had, uh, we had a, a lot of people leave and they just left things out. I mean, food stuff, their, their food items. And I'll tell you, uh, Hershey's Kisses are my number one on the list. If you could just take your Hershey's Kisses with you when you go, that would be great because for whatever reason, the mice really love that chocolate. Um, reducing clutter, as you can see, clutter is, is a great place for the mice to hide and every other little insect out there. So this is a little cubicle. I thought somebody was living here actually. Um, yeah, we need to uh, make sure we're cleaning under things, looking behind things moving things and just, you know, a deep cleaning. It, it's, it's amazing how much a deep cleaning will do for your IPM program, emptying your trash on a daily basis. Um, sorry about the sticky traps, but I had to point this one out. So this is uh, the use of sticky traps. We have uh, one center out at our Newburgh Center. It has passive ventilation. And uh, if I don't use sticky traps out there, it's it's amazing how many calls I get if I don't. Um, it does catch them, and you know what where they're coming from and what they are. Um, but yeah, sticky traps are are a great important part of monitoring. So this one is uh, another one of those pandemic ones where they left all their food stuff, and this is at one of our centers. It was a three story building, and uh, the mice were just. They, they were rampant through there last year and uh, we had to go down there and tear everything out and take all the food stuff away and, and trap for about 30 days. I think we pulled like 30 or 40 mice out of that building. So very important to have your staff take their food items home with them. Um, this one is uh, seal all your outside entries. Uh, this, is, this one was a pretty simple one that you can see the little cap right there on the air conditioning unit. They just didn't put that on there. And uh, we had uh, actual rats in the building. And uh, once we covered that up and put some snap traps out, our, our rat problem went away.
hardware cloth, uh, seal up all your outside entryways. Hardware cloth works great at this. Uh, once you get that set in there, you know, you, you want to come back and, and make sure you're checking it. They haven't chewed through it somehow or got around it. But hardware cloth is great for any outside uh, entryways. We want to make sure that we secure our trash enclosures. Um, we the, the picture on the right was at our southeast campus, and uh, as soon as we uh, put our gates up there, uh, we were having problems with uh, people getting into the trash and pulling it all out. So make sure you're securing your trash and that it's getting emptied in a, in a timely manner. I mean, if, even if you have to call your vendor to come pick up your debris containers or your trash enclosures. Uh, one of the things that we do as well is uh, we have this in our specifications that we, we keep our plant material two feet off the buildings and then we have a gravel barrier around the outside of the building and it just looks so much nicer, it's so much safer and it's better for our IPM program. I'm going to talk about uh, our uh, our chip drop. So we have chip drop up here in Portland, Oregon, and all the tree companies. It's an online thing, and you just sign up for it, and you can ask for chips to be dropped at your site. Uh, we've been doing it for probably about ten years, and then of course we any of our debris that we generate. Uh, luckily, we have the land to do this, and so every couple of years we'll bring in a tub grinder and grind our, our debris. And that's what you get is the finished product on the, on the right there. <clears throat> it's a great program. I haven't paid for bark dust in 10 years. And uh, it, looks, it looks really good in the landscape, in my opinion. So that's, our, that's a tub grinder that we get in every other couple of years. It's about $6,000 a, a stop. And so, we have two campuses that it gets done at our Rock Creek campus and our Sylvania campus. And we you know, use that material throughout the landscape. And that's just a debris pile picture. And that's what we, we generate all those chips from. And then you get a product like this, which is great stuff. We've had some real uh, good luck with this uh, compost. <clears throat> And then we've got our weed burner in action. I know Chris was talking about string trimmers and all that good stuff. So we use our weed burners in our stormwater facilities. They uh, we're not allowed to use any herbicides in certain districts for weed control. So we use uh, the weed burner on our hardscapes, you know, gravel pathways, you know, our curbs and stuff like that. And that cuts down on uh, herbicide use. When we can, we have a wildflower program uh, due to budget cuts. We haven't been able to do that for a year or two now, but wildflowers have their place and it's a great program and the neighbor, the neighborhood loves these uh, wildflowers. So when we can, we'll do that. It's, it's, it can get expensive. The wildflower seed does get expensive, but it's a great program. And then, um, you know, we hire our casual help. They come in and, uh, you know, hand weed and help us plant and, we want to make sure that uh, you know we're covering that bare ground, that that soil. You don't want anything exposed. That's that's where your weeds come in at. <clears throat> and so this is some of our our landscaping with our chips that we use. We put these out at uh, all our sites. Um, you know, five or six inches. Um, and in that middle picture, you can see the uh, there's a couple of weeds popped up there, but they're so easy to pull through the chips. It doesn't take as long as if they were you know, in that soil. So they're just growing through those chips. And then of course, we wanna make sure that we're covering the ground, the soil. So we got our ground cover out and it's, you know, it's covering the soil. There's no weeds in the, uh, coming through. And then we have a, uh, a spec now for our outer areas, our priority twos and threes where we use a meadow grass mixture. <clears throat> and then in the middle one is a fire lane. And the, the, the one on the right there is our Rock Creek campus, the front entrance. They just did that about two years ago. And it's, uh, it's a meadow grass. It's mixed with yarrow and clover and other grasses. And what we do there is we let that go six, seven weeks maybe, let it seed out, and then we'll mow it down. So not only are we 
doing better in our IPM program, but we're, our, our labor costs have gone down with this, uh, this meadow grass uh, mixture. Um, <clears throat> so if anybody has any questions or anything, you can post it on the Q&A and I can answer any questions. Um, I've got my, the next slide is I wanna thank everybody and the B Campus uh, people for allowing us to uh, present today. And uh, if you need any, uh, if you need any links or anything, my email address is there at the bottom. So thank you everyone. Great, thanks so much, Jack. Um, we have quite a bit of time now for questions. If you have questions for either of our presenters, um, Chris or Jack, and then we also have Sharon here. So Jack, would you wanna stop sharing your screen and then if everybody turns their video on, people can see all of us. Perfect, thank you. So if anyone has questions, it can be specific to either of these presentations. It could be a more general question. Uh, we're here to answer any of those. So feel free to put those in the chat. At this point, looks like we haven't gotten any questions yet, but that was a lot to digest. So people may be thinking through what questions they have. All right, somebody's wondering, I assume this is for Jack. They say specifically, what is your meadow grass seed mix? So it, it is a mix of yarrow and all kinds of different grasses. I don't have the spec right in front of me. There's a lot of clover in there. Um, we actually went at one point where we were, we were overseeding with clover because it, it's a great uh, for nitrogen. Um, and so the meadow grass, uh, that's, we started that about two or three years ago. It's in our specs now. Uh, we're going to see how it goes. There's, there's some pushback on it. It does look a little ragged sometimes. Um, so you got to, you know, right plant, right location, that kind of thing. But if, if, if you'd, you'd like, I can, I could send you the specs if you want to send me your email. Thank you. See if any other questions come in. All right, somebody says, thanks for all your insight. It's helpful to hear how some of these techniques can be replicated in other areas. And their question is, are there ways that organizations from across the country can support this work. I assume organizations that are not cities or campuses. And I know that that's kind of a general question, so I don't know if either Jack or Chris has thoughts on that or Sharon, feel free to jump in. I mean, there's certainly local advocacy for, uh, you know, city councils or county, uh, boards and so forth. If, if you don't have something in place, um, that's like the obvious first place to start. Um, um, I mean, there are groups like yours <laughs> and that, uh, you know, supporting Xerces or B Campus and so forth. Um, um, I don't have a rundown of, I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of specialists, more specialized um, pesticide advocacy groups out there like Beyond Pesticides or Pesticide Action Network. Uh, which delve into these uh, issues. Um, um, I don't have a I don't have a rundown <laughs> on the other organizations. They are definitely out there, but I think local advocacy is is really a great place to start. Yeah, and I would say your state extension services. That's a great resource. Um, you know, we use OSU, Oregon State University. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for for a source of information. Yeah, OSU is fantastic, and uh, UC IPM, UC the University of California Integrated Pest Management Program is also uh, great um, for our area. <laughs> so uh, well, back Cornell. east, yeah, back Cornell. east, Cornell, and Cornell is great. Um, there's also a system. Of, there's a national IPM center network. There is a there's Northeastern, 
oh gosh, Northeastern, Southeastern, Western. I don't know how many there are total, uh, but they serve as kind of clearing houses for IPM information and also for grants. So I, I guess I'll just add that, um, I mean, the way Kylie in which you phrase the question, are there ways that organizations from across the country can support this work? Um, I would say we're hoping to support you. <laughs> I don't know exactly who you are with, um, but we'd love to see the good examples that are being highlighted here um, used as models across the country. And so we're hoping that um, people will pick up on this if they don't already have a, an IPM program going, um, you know, learn these lessons from, you know, uh, what's been happening in places like San Francisco and Portland Community College. There are lots of other good examples too. Um, but the more that people are aware of this and can um, replicate this, you know, I think Chris's um, emphasis on the, this, the involvement of people from the community in education and Jack's also emphasized that sort of education communication sort of being the foundation of it. I mean, the more that this can be talked about within your community with people who are either responsible for, you know, landscape management, pest management, or people who care about it, I think um, you can kind of build that constituency and get some of these practices going. Um, hopefully that was helpful. I, I, if, I don't know where the, the person is located, but... Um... I already mentioned Rescape as well. And the whole idea of certifying sustainable landscapes is um, I think a great idea. And I mean, we're on the, we've been trying to support them for years um, because it gives, um, it helps create a market. Um, you have to be certified as a Bay friendly landscaper to create these landscapes and they have the trainings and then they have, um, a lot of local governments requiring it for their various parcels. So it kind of becomes this, um, um, this cycle, a positive uh, feedback loop, uh, ideally. So um, Rescape, if you're in California, is, is a great place to, to tap into. I have another question that's um, about different regions of the country. So this person is wondering, they say, uh, do you think it's more challenging for weed control when you live in the southern states, like South Carolina, where it's hot and rainy in the summer? And we're asking three people who live in the western states, so we'll see if we have some insight into uh, conditions in the south. I'm from Ohio. Yeah, it's more challenging. You got, I mean, we, we're lucky in some ways. For some weeds, if we can get them uh, controlled uh, early in the dry season, and then we won't, don't have to mess with them later on, depending on the, the weed and depending on the soil. Uh, whereas back there, it's constant, right? So no doubt, it's it's more challenging. It take would take more more effort. Um, back, I'm sure South Carolina has lots of weeds. <laughs> Another question. This one's for you, Chris. Um, do you have any suggestions on who should be on the IPM committee? And I am guessing Jack and Sharon may have some thoughts on this question as well. So, so like, like I assume this is kind of a local agency committee of some sort. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I recommend finding um, champions if it's a city government find champions within city government like for example um, progressive minded um, uh, landscape managers or uh, facility managers who are committed to this idea you, to be on that committee it's absolutely essential to have people who do the work on that committee <laughs> um, uh, there's I've seen too many spectacular failures in cases where it was not where it was just politicians or just activists you know, all well-meaning, but um, you have to have that ground truth. You have to know what's going on, on the ground, honoring the honoring the expertise. Yeah, Jack and Sharon, do you have any thoughts on who ought to be at the table talking about IPM? Well, I would. Uh, you know, my first thought is environmental health and safety. Anybody in that in that department, because they they know all the rules on that side. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, what Chris said is, you know, your landscape technicians, your applicators, the people that are actually out there doing the work, they understand what what can be done and what can't be done. So sometimes there's that that big hurdle of, oh, we want to try this. And you know what? We, we tried that uh, that foamer. You know, there was a, we we it was a it was basically a carpet machine that you, you put the foam down and it heated the weed up. And I'm, you know, it's like, you know what, we're not going to be able to vacuum the whole landscape. So that, that you know, that just went, and it was $7,000 for this machine. So no, we're not going to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, we went to a, a freeze machine where you're actually freezing the weeds. We tested that and that didn't work, but the weed burners and the, the casual help, the people that you can get in there to actually pull weeds and make sure that you, you know, you've got, you're covering the bare soil and, and keeping the chips nice and thick. That kind of stuff really gets your, your program going from, from the base. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I, I would sort of say anybody who really has a stake in this, um, you know, I mean, if you're a city, it's a little bit different than a campus, but a city obviously has residents, has a governing structure. Campuses have governing structures too. Um, and people on the ground and neighbors. But so, you know, I think that having a balance of those different interests, those different stakeholders is important. Um, and the involvement, I mean, there's obviously like in a, in a city or campus, there's decision makers, there's hierarchies and all that kind of stuff. So um, making sure that, you know, the program has involvement at the different levels, I think is really important as well. Um, Does anyone else have any questions? I think we've gone on a minute to think that through. In the meantime, do any of you have final thoughts or things you'd want to pass along to people? I think our audience is quite uh, varied. There are probably some people who are part of cities and campuses that have pretty well developed IPM plans and others who may just be starting out. Um, so I don't know if you have any closing thoughts on advice for people. I'll jump in. I just, um, you know, in, in the B city, B campus commitment, there's a commitment for an IPM plan. And I'm kind of hoping that through these practitioner series, especially that we have been beginning to feature and that will continue to feature that um, people who represent B cities who are on the B city or the B campus committee will recognize it's not just about the plan and putting it on the shelf. You know, I think Jack talked about this and um, it's important to at least get started and sometimes looking at other examples and everything. But of course, you have to tailor it to your own community and it has to be kind of a living document. It has to be a living program. Um, and so um, it's important to recognize that and, 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 and get past any preconception that it's kind of like a one and done type thing. So um, yeah. I don't want to make it sound like it's more work than it is. And I think that um, Chris talked about how he was proud of this 20 year committee involvement with a you know real input from people in the community. And he also talked about it being fun, you know, people learning at these weed summits, rat summits, whatever, you know. <laughs> I think there's an opportunity to really build a community around these types of things. Yeah, I'd have to say, uh, yeah, get a plan, be committed. Uh, you got to start somewhere. So if, if you can at least get a plan and, and, and get some commitment to it, uh, I, I won't lie, it's a lot of work, especially up here in the state of Oregon. It's a lot of work. It's a lot, there's a lot of paperwork, but it, it needs to be done. It's real important. And it's a state statute up here in Oregon for the schools. So we're on board. One, one other thing just to throw in, uh, as far as plans go, it's it, the one really essential element of any good plan is you have to have roles and responsibilities. It can't just be a statement of policy. It needs to have, you know, who is doing it. So um, you'd be surprised how often that's missing and that prevents it from really being effective. 
yeah, our, our plan is uh, 75 pages long and it, it delves right into every, okay, this is your responsibility as a custodial staff. You need to do this as a groundskeeper, you need to do this. And, you know, as a manager, you know, here's your responsibility. So uh, real important. That's great. Well, thank you, everyone. We have some comments coming in that people who attended this are saying thanks so much. This is really helpful. I agree. This was great to hear from uh, to places that are BCD and B campus affiliates and get some really specific examples um, of how you're approaching these issues. So thank you so much for joining us. The recording of this session will be posted on the BCD website um, as a YouTube video. So if you enjoyed this so much that you want to watch it many more times, you can do that or you can send it uh, to other people in your community who you think it would be helpful um, to see. So thanks again. You will get a survey emailed to you about this session, and we hope that you'll fill that out. It helps us plan future webinars and make sure that we're delivering content that's helpful to people. So thanks so much, and I hope you have a good rest of your day.